everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for our webinar on um, COP26. So as you can see from the title, we have decided to say to call the webinar COP26 Unmasked. It is a pun on the fact that um, in at least in Singapore, where um, Linda and I are both currently uh, physically located, it is uh, mandatory to wear a mask both indoors and outdoors, and therefore um, an unmasked uh, unmasking is one of the rare times we see each other's faces. Um, and uh, we also hope that today we can have a fairly frank um, discussion about the COP26 uh, conference and the decisions. Uh, bearing in mind, of course, that uh, all four of us are academics and professors uh, who teach um, climate change law or international environmental law. Um, so uh, briefly, I'll just introduce uh, the speakers. Um, I'm Jolene Lin. I'm the director of the Asia Pacific Center of Envi uh, Environmental Law here at NUS, and I'm on the faculty and I teach climate change law. I'm introducing myself first only because I am serving as the informal moderator. Today, I'm really honored to have with me all my three dear friends. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us on your day off. Tomorrow is a public holiday in the Philippines, and Lisa is in the true academic style, writing a paper for the rest of the day. And um, Lisa is an attorney and professor of law with more than 20 years of experience uh, in advocacy, in teaching, and in policy negotiations um, at uh, the University of Cebu, where she is the professor at the College of Law. She teaches international environmental law, administrative law, property law, and um, also recently has joined Oceana in the Philippines as its legal and policy director. Beatrice. Beatrice is one of my dearest friends who actually was a visitor in one of my first classes ever when nobody recognized who the professor was. Beatrice is a senior lecturer at Western Sydney University, where she leads in a very fascinating project on forestry on, and how indigenous communities um, in the Amazon have done amazing work in conserving their homes in the forest. And she um, is currently working on a book on dispute, um, alternative dispute res resolution to be published by Oxford University Press. Um, Beatrice has also extensive uh, private sector and public sector experience um, relating to trade policy and forestry protection. And uh, Linda. Linda is um, a senior research fellow here at uh, the Asia Pacific Center for Environmental Law and currently an associate professor at Gajah Mada University in Indonesia. Linda is an internationally recognized scholar in Indonesian law, environmental law international environmental law and um, is a member uh, and was a member of the delegation uh, leading Indonesia's negotiations of the Paris Agreement. Uh, from 2018 to 2021 this year, Linda is a lead author of the IPCC's sixth assessment report. And without further ado, I am going to hand over the floor to Lisa, who is going to share with us her views of COP26. Thank you. Over to you, Lisa. Um, so good morning to everyone and um, Mabuhay from the Philippines. Um, before I start my, my 10 minutes um, chat with you, uh, I'd like to first share a picture which actually triggered uh, the ideas that I wanted to share with you today. So um, let's just share it briefly. So this is this picture of the mother and daughter team uh, who are promoting indigenous rights. And um, they actually join the COP26. Uh, the mother is actually the former UN rapporteur uh, for indigenous peoples, uh, while the daughter seems to have followed the footsteps of uh, the mother. So why did I choose uh, this story and this picture? I think for someone who comes from the Philippines, I have not been really um, involved, uh, unlike my good friend here, Linda, in, in COP negotiations for the country. I've always been on the periphery of discussions and as an academic mostly. Um, so um, I'd like to also share today the plight of you know, people who are at the periphery, especially in COP26, in, during the recent COP26 discussions. So um, the plight of indigenous groups has always been 
included as a discussion point. Uh, that's a given. But it still largely remains a peripheral topic. And, and this is despite the fact that we know that indigenous people play an important part in protecting our marine biodiversity. In fact, in the Philippines, you know, most of the almost you know, uh, pristine and intact forests are still under uh, the ancestral domain of our indigenous people. So they are um, similar to uh, indigenous people across the globe. They are protecting about um, you know, 80% of the biodiversity uh, that are remaining across, across the globe. So um, when you talk about uh, the role of um, indigenous peoples, it's, it's important that they're given a voice and they are included, uh, but there are bureaucratic and structural barriers to inclusion and recognition of these people, especially in, in conferences like COP uh, and the, the recently concluded COP26. Um, but, you know, um, Vicky and Jean, who are the mother and daughter team that I showed to you, actually understand because of their experience how to navigate the hallways and the language associated with these negotiations. But they know also, as they said, it can be exclusionary for many others who can be left behind as a result. So um, the, in, in fact, based on their recent experience, um, many of the civil society organizations that were expected to attend the COP26 had to stay at home due to log logistics expenses and the pandemic. So they were actually one of the few lucky ones from the global south who were able um, to, to participate in the recently concluded uh, conference of parties. But they are, or they should be included because they are knowledge holders from, from regions where you, know, you have all the biodiversity that, that will help us you know, be able to adapt and mitigate the effects or impacts of climate change. And as you know, um, I live in the Philippines and I've been a uh, first-hand witness of the many environmental destruction that continues unabated in this country and, and in many regions in the global south. And they are actually, uh, this destruction have increasingly exposed and marginalized communities like the indigenous peoples. Um, Many indigenous people, uh, peoples are actually living in, in very vulnerable ecosystems, like the Arctic, you know, the low-lying islands, the high, high mountains. Um, the, the mother and daughter team I showed you actually uh, are part of a tribe who lives um, in the mountains of northern uh, Philippines. But they have learned uh, already that, you know, there's so many... Um, destructions like mining and dam projects that devastate their natural ecosystems and leave damage to their landscape. They're actually, um, you know, uh, our people, especially just like other indigenous peoples, these are, they, they are people that are very much tied to the land and, and they know, you know, a lot about farming cycles that takes its cue from, um, their cue from nature. So, for the for in the case of uh, Jing and Vicky Talawi Tawil Tawuli Cruz Corpus rather, um, usually they they wait for a certain bird to come that signals that it's time to start planting, but those patterns have changed now, and so they need to adapt to the changes, and then that they have to also adapt to more extreme events now. Just recently, you know. They had two typhoons and for the first time they experienced flooding, which is actually unusual for a mountain town where they live. So, well, the key to being resilient, in, in fact, for, for many of these indigenous peoples and, and developing countries like where I live is to, to be able to adapt to the shifting challenges um, of climate change. And, and so we have to have all the, as a result of many negotiations. Um, climate finance, which I know was a center, central point of discussion during COP26, will have to be directed to helping indigenous uh, communities and developing countries deal with climate change. I know that you know, there were pledges made during COP26, an increase in funding were, were promised and 
this should be directly uh, made available to these communities as well as developing countries. Um, because we need to reverse forest loss. Right? We need to reverse all the uh, degradation of our lands by 2010, 2030, so that we can combat climate change and li limit global temperature rise. Yet, you know, what, what, as what we've seen, um, most countries in Southeast Asia actually did not commit, uh, uh, including, I think, um, you know, Indonesia, the Philippines, um, did not make a clear commitment as to um, protecting our forests. I think Beatrice will be talking about this. Um, in terms of uh, now the role of, similar to the role of indigenous people, I will now shift to the role of developing countries and like the Philippines where I come from. And uh, as you know, um, the, the extreme weather events have battered the Philippines for so long. And, and we, we are used to it actually, you know, we're used to at least 20 typhoons per year. But we are not, what we are not used to is actually typhoons that come in in certain months that they should never have come in, you know. Um, that's unusual for us uh, for the last decade or so. And um, for, for us who battle um, extreme weather conditions are most vulnerable to climate change, we actually need, as developing countries, need to have our voices heard, not only locally, but also at the global stage. So um, the latest IPCC report says that, um, you know, there's a code red, there's a warning for a code red uh, for humanity, which means that it, uh, we must have immediate action on a global scale to halt climate change on its tracks. The evidence is there, but um, however, you know, um, what do the, the latest COP26 tell us? Um, well, um, with like people for uh, like us or millions of people who are facing the biggest risk from from climate disaster, we need to see um, how uh, we could get, you know, um, funding or climate funding to fund uh, to find solutions, uh, and in terms of adaptation to climate change, and and so um, we have to put our efforts into seeking and finding solutions, teaching our communities to participate and contribute to finding solutions so that uh, climate disasters will not devastate many communities, uh, especially in those highly vulnerable areas. Um, however, you know, communities that are and countries with the largest stake in climate change discussions are often sidelined, similar to indigenous peoples communities. So um, as um, leaders were hammering out agreements on reducing carbon emissions during COP26, um, they are not, you know, millions of people and countries who represent these millions of people are not even, um, you know, at the, at the core of the discussion or let alone uh, at the core of uh, the actions to be taken in order to, you know, to um, make uh, resiliency as a center point for, for most countries. Um, so there, are, there were many who participated. In fact, in our country, uh, you know, we were surprised that uh, our finance minister represented the country during our discussions. And they, they were saying that, you know, they actually were, were quite confident that, you know, climb the, the climate finance uh, financing requirement for the Philippines uh, that will cover the costs of climate change would be addressed during um, the, the COP26. However, I, we have learned that, you know, they have returned from the negotiations with less than what they have expected to raise. So climate financing is therefore um, an obligation that needs to be at the core of the most critical issues that you know, uh, governments must discuss and which governments have to deliver. So I, I, end, I end my, my 10 minute talk on that because I know that climate financing will be talked about later on by Jolene and you know, um, 
this since ever since the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was ratified in 1992, that obligation has been there. And, and so um, we need to understand it better and so that you know this finance for lost and damage uh, must be considered um, separately from adaptation and institutional mechanisms and must prioritize the most vulnerable people. So thank you so much. I'll be happy to answer your any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And thank you so much for the um, reminder to a lot of us that, you know, while the negotiations take place in these faraway locations and um, ultimately the people who in the most effect are communities, communities, especially in places in developing countries who will be very badly affected and who are already suffering the impacts of climate change. Um, I now hand over the floor to Beatrice, who is going to share with us her views. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jolene. I'm very honored and happy to be here among very dear friends and wonderful colleagues. Thank you all participants for being here today as well. Um, today I wanted to discuss basically three points with you. For, it's about mostly about outcomes of COP26 regarding forests. Um, this is my first point. Then I want to discuss about COP promises versus reality, uh, using Brazil as an example. Third point will be about the way forward. So I'll start with point number one, which is about the outcomes of COP26. And I'll be focusing on the Glasgow leaders' declaration on forests and land use, which I'll probably just share with you, as I think it will be easier for you to visualize. So this is the declaration that we had. Can you see, guys, my screen? Everything good? Right. Okay, so, so this is the, the declaration that came out of the uh, COP26. <clears throat> and I wanted to start about with the net positives and then the negatives, I guess, of this declaration. So as you can see here, I think there is one uh, important point at the preamble. You can see here there is a link between forests, biodiversity, and climate change. A recognition that these three, three things have to go together. We cannot solve one problem without the other. So I think that's a very positive thing. And also, as you can see here, and as you know, we now have a target to stop and reverse forest loss and degradation by 2030. And it's a positive to have a global target. And as you can see here, we, can, we have a lot of countries that have endorsed that declaration, including large forest countries, such as Brazil, Indonesia, Russia, among others. So this um, would be, I guess, the positives of um, the Glasgow Declaration of Forests. And not only that, we also had a um, pledge uh, of financing for forest protection, restoration. So we have basically develop, developed countries saying that they will provide $12 billion for forest related climate finance between 2021 and 2025. So all those things, I guess, are positive news. Um, but now about the negatives of the uh, Glasgow Declaration on Forests. First uh, point would be about the legal status of these instruments. Um, it is a non-legally binding instrument. And we have seen all the similar instruments being adopted in the past. Uh, in 1992 in Rio, we have also voluntary political uh, um, instrument on forests. Also in 2014, we have another declaration on forests in New York. Okay, so we now it's a third non-legally binding instrument on that issue. In terms of the content of the declaration, we see an instrument that has no prescriptive language. There are no short-term specific measures as to how we are going to achieve the 2030 target, right? So it seems that we have a goal without a realistic pathway as to how we're going to achieve that goal. Um, and I guess there are issues with the 2030 targeting itself. Um, 
This target shows a low level of ambition. ambition. And why is that? Because what will be left of forests in 10 years time, right? So if you, um, you probably follow what scientists and the scientific community has been said uh, about forests. Um, and for example, if you look at the Amazon, if you, if you uh, um, use the Amazon as, a, as an example, there is this um, recognition that the Amazon may be reaching a point of no return. Right. So basically, it's when the forest will stop being a carbon sink and will start be becoming a source of greenhouse gas emissions. So the Amazon may enter very soon a process that is called a process of savannization. The, pro the, 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 the forest stop, will stop being a, a rainforest and will, be, will become savannas, right? And I just wanted to quickly read for you uh, an extract extract of a um, publication of two scientists that have been studying the Amazon for so many years, for a lifetime, and they are internationally uh, renowned. First one is Thomas Lovejoy and Carlos Nobri. They have published a, a paper in 2019 called The Amazon uh, Tipping Point, Less Chance for Action. And that's what they say. Bluntly put, the Amazon not only cannot withstand further deforestation, but now requires rebuilding. We scientists who have been studying the Amazon for many decades, we know that we are now in a moment of destiny. The tipping point is here, it's now. The peoples and leaders of the Amazon countries together have the power, the science and the tools to avoid a continental scale indeed a global environmental disaster, okay? So this is something that we have to bear in mind if we think that we are giving ourselves 10, 10 years to uh, really stop, stop reversing uh, deforestation in the Amazon and in other forest areas as well. All right, so now to my point number two, uh, which relates to COP promises uh, versus reality and the example of what is happening in Brazil. I just wanted to call your attention that just a few days after COP26, we have um, known the official numbers of deforestation in the Amazon, okay? And in 2020, we have seen the worst uh, deforestation uh, rates in the last, and, and highest in the last 15 years in the Amazon. And what makes things worse is that these numbers, they were known uh, by the government before, prior to COP26, but they decided to hire, to hide those uh, numbers and they have been released just after the COP26. So basically what happened since uh, Bolsonaro took office, since the current Brazilian government is that um, there have been very low enforcement actions in the Amazon, very low, very, very few penalties being issued by for environmental crimes and other offenses. Um, there has been a, a cut of funding for climate action in Brazil and for key environmental agencies such as the Ministry of Environment, enforcement agencies in general. So the enforcement action has been very, uh, very poor. So my question to you is, what can we expect from governments such as the Brazilian government um, uh, in terms of achieving that 2030 target? And I'll now move to my last point, which relates to uh, the way forward. Is there any hope, right? Um, I think my main point, particularly in relation to the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest is that we need to have a realistic pathway to get to the 2030 target, right? We need to have short-term and measurable actions to get there. I think another import, important point also relates to the, to the links between deforestation and um, international trade. Those links must be much clearer and traceable. If you think of the Amazon again, we know that uh, soy and cattle are the main drivers of deforestation in the Amazon for many years. So we should try to have deforestation-free supply chains and we should be tracing those things. 
right? I think it is the job of NGOs, media and academia to try to make those links between deforestation and trade and make those links uh, more well known to the public. Uh, finally, I think in my opinion, we need alternative sources of funding for forest conservation. I don't think that the United Nations and or developed countries, the funding provided by those sources will be enough for, uh, for us to achieve um, higher levels of forest conservation. Anyways, I'll stop here. Uh, I'll look forward to your questions and comments and thank you very much again for this opportunity. Thank you, Beatrice. And um, I totally, I, I'm really um, support this idea of making this link between trade and deforestation. And only today it was reported that the, Bra the Brazilian foreign minister has lashed out against the European Union's proposed law um, to, that would force companies that will be selling beef, soy, palm oil, wood into the European Union to prove that the commodities are not produced on land that has been deforested or degraded. And of course, these products, a lot of them come from Brazil. So that's something definitely a space worth watching. Um, thank you so much, uh, Beatrice. I'm going to now um, hand over the floor to Linda. The floor is yours, Linda. Thank you, uh, Jolene. I'm sharing my screen. <clears throat> now, uh, do you see my PowerPoint presentation? Okay, so um, continuing from the first two speakers, uh, Lisa Oz and Beatrice, um, I do agree that somehow the results from the COP26 is very lukewarm. Uh, it's not hot, but well, it's not cold either. But also um, the fact that the pledges made uh, by the countries are, you know, uh, very, up there and <laughs> there's almost um, hard to see it, how they do it nationally. So um, in terms of Article 6, uh, one of the main achievement of COP26, Jolene will uh, talk more about this, but there is like one phrase that was going to be agreed in Article 6 that was watered down uh, about phasing out of coal that it became facing down instead of facing out. Um, the, the, agreed, uh, the agreed decision was facing down uh, on Article 6 on coal. So uh, in Indonesia, like my uh, study area, <clears throat> we understand that uh, Indonesia also making big commitments in coal uh, in the COP. But uh, we have to understand that uh, the country itself is the second world's biggest coal importer, only, uh, only second to Australia. And then uh, it generated 38 billion US dollars in the first semester alone. So in six months, it's 38 uh, billion US. Uh, Indonesia plans to stop uh, commissioning new coal fired power plants and phase out coal or now phase down coal <laughs> for electricity by 2056 under a new greener long-term economic vision. Uh, also for net zero, uh, initially it was 2070 for Indonesia, but then it brought forward to 2060 or sooner. So up until now, uh, there's no like formal document or formal fixed year yet on when the net zero for this country is going to be reached. Um, but Indonesia is still exploring ways to keep consuming and extracting uh, value from coal by CCS, uh, carbon capture storage technology. Uh, although, uh, as we know, CCS uh, is unproven and very expensive. So it's arguably very hard to implement in the country. If uh, Indonesia transition to cleaner energy sources, this will reduce its emission by 38%. So a big chunk of the country's emission. As we can see here, coal is the yellow part. So you see in the graphic, coal is going up and up by the year in uh, primary energy mixes uh, record in Indonesia. So the second point uh, also uh, already discussed by uh, Beatrice uh, is the forest and deforestation. 
uh, most probably. If the Amazon is uh, destroyed by so, uh, soy, uh, Indonesian's tropical forest is destroyed by palm oil. But however, in COP26, Indonesia pledged for carbon neutrality by 2030 without any firm commitment on ending deforestation, right? Uh, uh, the government stated that forest fire has fell to 82% in 2020 and rehabilitated 600,000 hectares of mangroves, uh, mangrove forest. Um, a moratorium for primary uh, clearing of primary forest. And this is like all our like big steps for Indonesia. But and then uh, there was a tweet gate by the minist Minister of Environment and Forestry uh, that, you know, sort of uh, uh, confusing everybody about Indonesia's commitment on deforestation because some of the tweet that got, you know, viral was that the goal of zero deforestation is incompatible with the crucial need for Indonesia to make vibrant economic progress. So it's sort of like, yeah, we want uh, economic progress, but you know, uh, also we don't want to uh, destroy everything, but we still want to have deforestation. And this comes from the minister herself. So that's um, that's the ambiguity of uh, commitment, I think. Uh, the public uh, communication that is confusing for uh, people who are um, who are very invested on on this this you know saving ourselves from climate impact, right? Because tackling deforestation itself in Indonesia will reduce uh, uh, Indonesia's emission by sixty percent, so a huge chunk. So what, what are the consequences here if uh, countries, not only Indonesia, but other countries also, you know, develop and developing countries are not consistent to their own commitment? So experts are saying that uh, it's the state consent that creates opportunities for subnational actors to demand state accountability in climate mitigation and adaptation. So, uh, even though like internationally, we haven't seen climate litigation being tried in international courts or tribunals, but we have seen uh, climate cases on the rise nationally in many, many spots in the world. Um, UNEP has a report on this that says, you know, at least there are uh, uh, 1,550 climate cases in eight countries in the world. And there are like landmark cases, which you can read on the screen, which inspire other cases spiraling around the world. Uh, in India, for example, th there's like this big, this big uh, tribunal of NGT that managed to, you know, in its own motion, Suomoto, like bring um, the local government to court to be responsible of what they do. So it's not just, you know, uh, it's not just um, a document that you put your consent on, but you really have to act on it. Or as, as citizens, we can ask for, you know, um, your responsibility, right? So uh, state parties uh, to the Paris Agreement should prepare for the possibility to see the increase of environmental and specifically climate litigation uh, increase uh, nationally. So environmental courts and tribunals all over the world, uh, we have seen this, you know, um, uh, everywhere in Europe, Africa, uh, Asia, uh, Oceania, that some countries have environmental courts and tribunals, these countries would be more prepared. And, you know, these, these courts and tribunals would be more prepared for environmental and specifically climate litigations. But how about countries without environmental courts and tribunals? Well, uh, the trends have shown that um, countries have uh, train their general court judges with environmental uh, law matters, so training. So they would understand when there are environmental cases uh, uh, being filed in the general court so they can deal with it um, specifically, unlike, you know, unlike judges that are not trained. So uh, back to the study area, 
uh, to Indonesia, to my country, there are already um, 85 climate related court cases uh, from 2010 to 2019. So during the nine, the spread of the nine years, right? So um, although uh, the uh, climate change does not uh, in majority, mostly it's being uh, argued as a claim within like forest fire cases or um, uh, climate uh, uh, admin cases. Uh, there are like, you know, at least one or two that climate case, uh, climate change became like the first claim in the case. So uh, it's a huge Im improvement in Indonesia. And this shows that climate climate change issues is accepted uh, uh, as you know one of the peril, but also one of the solution when we are requesting for uh, government responsibility. Indonesia, however, has no environmental courts and tribunal, but they have trained their judges on environmental uh, law matters since 2012. So they have green benches, uh, in uh, you know all over the district court and uh, trial court in the country. So uh, my conclusion is that the lukewarm um, results from COP26 can inspire subnational actors to demand their countries to fulfill obligation and commitments uh, to steer them and the world away from environmental and climate catastrophe. And that countries, including Indonesia, Brazil, Philippines, Singapore, and other countries in the world will need to be prepared for future climate litigation inspired by you know, previous landmark cases and by inadequacy of their governments. So uh, the current environmental courts and tribunal and general courts needs to be aware and train on environmental issues. So that's uh, the end of my presentation and uh, I welcome the discussion. Thank you, Jolene. Thank you, Linda. There was a brief comment in the question and a but Indonesia and Australia are the largest coal exporters. I am sure that's because of just a small typo on your typographical error on your slides. And um, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. yes, you're right. You're right. All. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 that's all. Just wanted to clarify that for the yeah, purposes yeah. of the recording and um, that disposes of the question. All right. So thank you so much, Linda. Um, it's um. Really, uh, it's a real privilege to have um, two speakers here share with us the views of the two largest forest countries, right? Basically, Brazil and Indonesia um, here with us today because deforestation has been a big focus of COP26 in a way that it was not in previous COPs, um, clearly because of the recognized links between um, um, for deforestation and, and climate change. So um, I'm going to start my presentation and I hope I will, I will I'll take no more than 10 minutes. Uh, all right, so first of all, um, COP26. COP26 was interesting. It was notable for the numerous pledges made within the first week of negotiations. We've heard all, from other speakers, right? Coal, deforestation, electric vehicles, private sources of financing, so on and so forth. It was really like a blizzard of promises and pledges coming out of Glasgow in the midst of winter. Now that's all good, but nothing meaningful if it's not backed by policies and programs. These are statements of intentions and of often not fulfilled. And I think that's really something important to note in terms of what Beatrice has mentioned about the need to keep for, for, for um, the media, for civil society, for academics, etc., to basically keep these pledges in the limelight and say, hey, you made this pledge, what's happening? What are you doing with this? HSBC, for example, BlackRock, for example, big companies that have made huge pledges, uh, but which continue to um, finance uh, coal-fired power plants in developing countries. Now, COP26 was the first conference of the parties since the Paris Agreement took effect in 2020. And so it's a test run. It was a test run of whether the Paris Agreement would work to provide a durable framework for international climate cooperation. Now, I would say it seems to be working. That's the good news. There's, however, a great, room of uh, uh, a great deal of room for improvement. And I'll say, I'll say a little bit more about the centerpiece of the Paris Agreement, which is a system of nationally determined contributions whereby countries make climate action pledges, which are expected to become more ambitious over time. These pledges are 
the, as I said, the nationally determined contributions, and I'll refer to them as the NDCs. In the lead up to COP26, many countries strengthened their targets for 2030 and made net zero commitments. While they are not enough to meet the temperature limits of staying well below 1.5 degrees uh, or even well below 2 degrees, um, the NDC mechanism seems to be capable of even bringing laggards like Australia to the table with an updated target of net zero emissions by 2050. And I don't use the term lagger lightly. The NGO German Watch um, releasing an update to its climate change performance index during the COP gave Australia a score of zero for its climate policy amongst developed economies. What is worrying is that there are quite a few countries whose updated NDC is nominally stronger or worse still would lead to higher emissions than before. For example, Mexico's updated NDC, NDC lowers its climate ambition and transparency. Um, Singapore submitted its updated NDC in 2020. It does not limit emissions growth beyond what it had already committed to under its first NDC. While the updated NDC um, was an improvement in terms of clarity and transparency, it is not an enhanced NDC that complies with the Paris Agreement's requirement that each successive NDC should be a progression beyond the current one. The good news is that Singapore has announced after COP26 that it will review its NDC in response to the Glasgow Climate Pledge, which urged parties to return to next year's COP to be held in Egypt with even more ambitious NDCs. Now, when we come to, to looking at um, Article 6, of the Paris Agreement. This was a contentious issue, has been a contentious issue, one of the issues that remains outstanding for the um, implementation of the Paris Rule Now, the key terms of the climate pact at Glasgow insofar as they relate to Article 6, which is really on carbon markets. Well, first, parties have agreed there will be a fixed uh, tariff on emissions set of five, sorry, fixed tariff set on emissions trading um, it will be set at 5%. The tariff will only apply to the trade of voluntary emissions, but not national transfers made under 6.2. When we look at the limitations on the use of pre-2020 credits, now this was a very, this has always been a contentious issue for countries who were who are major hosts of clean development mechanism projects, which um, was the main mechanism for generating carbon credits under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, so major jurisdictions that held, um, that were host to all these CDM projects were Brazil, India, and China. They wanted to be able to use their CDM credits in the new Article 6 market. And negotiators have agreed to limit the use of pre-2020 credits from the CDM. Um, they have to be registered after January, uh, 1st January 2013 to be utilized for the purposes of the NDCs, which means that CDM targets that were generated before 1st January 2013 will not be eligible for use. Um, this, however, does not prevent a flooding of carbon credits into the markets because there are many carbon credits that have been generated since 2013. Now, um, there is... Article six, the Article six negotiations have concluded that there will be a supervisory board that will rely on designated operational entities who will verify independently these projects to ensure that they are environmentally integrous, that they're, in, they're additional, and they do not, con, um, they do not uh, lead to, uh, they should be avoiding double counting of carbon emissions. Now, my personal view of this is that there needs to be a lot, a lot of attention paid to the integrity of the system, because one key lesson that we have learned from the clean development mechanism is how easy it is for a market in carbon credits to lead to what we call hot air credits, credits that actually did not correspond to actual emissions reductions. Um, I do not need to belay the point, there is a massive literature on it. And I was somewhat had a moment of deja vu when, conclusion, when the, 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 the negotiations concluded on this point, because in 2008, 
um, a dear friend of mine, Charlotte Shrek of Climate Focus, and I led a research project looking into the Clean Development Mechanism Board, um, sorry, the Clean Development Mechanisms Board decision-making processes. And while we would say, I would say that the Article 6 is a major improvement in the public scrutiny and transparency of the decisions issued by the, uh, the, the, the supervisory board, um, the fact that there is still going to be heavy reliance on designated operational entities, which were the focus of scandals, because they had, in the, during the CDM, during the period of the CDM, the DOEs, came under close scrutiny for their inability to properly verify credits. So the fact that we are relying on that again, I think we need to be very careful. We need to be very vigilant about the actual emissions being reached. Now, my final point where we were looking at um, briefly on climate finance, um, it's a huge topic, but what really caught my eye during the negotiations, or at least one of the pledges, was the pledge by former Bank of England governor, now a UN special envoy on climate and finance, that he is going to be able to commit $130 trillion of private sector assets to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions. His announcement at COP26 was made when he was actually accompanied by um, BlackRock's Laura Finn, uh, Larry Finn and Jane Fraser, said the group. Now, so, Carney said that there has not been enough money in the world to fund the transition to renewable energy by 2050. But thanks to the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, we have all the money needed. The alliance is supported by more than 450 banks, insurers, and asset managers. $130 trillion equals to 40% of the global financial system assets. And so when one reads this number, you're like, wow, this is a major, major shift in the global financial system towards decarbonization. So question, how credible is this pledge? Now, I'm not a financier, so that's something that I will definitely proclaim. I mean, I'll, I'll acknowledge. But one thing that you, we all know is how to double count. How do we account for assets that, were be that belong to a pension scheme and is being managed by another investment management company? And these assets are both counted as part of the $130 trillion. Now, so there's a lot of work now that and there's been a lot of work that has been done to try to demystify this $130 uh, pledge. Now, one must remember that it includes assets that are mortgages. It includes financing for fossil fuel, uh, fuel projects, exploration projects. So that's something we need to watch. These are big uh, pledges. And um, as Beatrice has mentioned, promises versus reality. And I'll end my, my, with just two comments, space to watch. I think as what Beatrice um, has mentioned, one big space to watch is the link between climate action and trade. The EU has already proposed a new law that would force companies that sell beef, palm oil, coffee, cocoa into the European Union to prove that the companies, uh, they, sorry, to prove that the commodities were not produced on land that has been deforested or degraded after 2020. Obviously, has already led to much cries of trade protectionism, but this is one interesting proposal and work it together with some of the other due diligence laws that could be used to look into supply chains. That's really interesting space. And the second thing, as um, Linda has mentioned, uh, climate litigation, that's again going to rise and it's continuing to rise right after uh, COP26 in South Africa, a group of youth and uh, activists have come together to sue the, co the, the government on its coal co policy. Thank you, and I look forward to the Q&A. We do have one question, uh, and I'm going to start by posing it to the three speakers here. Um, first question, what do you think are the obstacles preventing developed countries from providing climate financing to developing countries? The, 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 question, uh, the person who posed the question said, my impression is that the rising demand for green technology and clean energy 
should make it profitable for industry leaders to invest in these fields, especially in fast growing Southeast Asian countries. I'm gonna first invite Lisa to speak on this, then Beatrice and then Linda. Lisa, over to you. Well, I, I guess it's uh, just, just the sheer lack of commitment uh, and uh, taking you know, uh, their promises, as you said, to reality. Um, you know, there has been you know, so many meetings in the past where, where this has been, as I said, since uh, 1992 when the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change Climate financing has always been there, um, but I guess it's it's really uh, the lack of commitment um, of developed countries to um, provide climate financing, um, and and so um, I think the shift in, in, in with the Paris Agreement with the NDCs uh, this uh, actually provides an opportunity for um, developed countries to look into um, opportunities to to support um, countries, developing countries in their transition uh, from, you know, um, coal towards renewable energy. And with, uh, as you said, um, uh, the NDCs being reviewed and uh, having stronger commitments from, from these developing countries. So um, I, I think the opportunities there, it's just that I think th there needs to be also an accountability mechanism for developed countries for not following up, following through with their promises. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Beatrice, yes, your turn. Yeah, okay, thank you so much. I think it's a question of priorities, but I would say a level of hypocrisy as well, because we cannot achieve mitigation or the, um, the, the scales of mit mitigation that we need to achieve without assistance, without providing countries uh, that just transition that we're talking about. So we want countries to phase out coal, for example, but we leave India, for example, with no help. They have to do it themselves, right? So these things just have to walk together. They are not walking together. So we, as Jolene was mentioning, we hear those pledges and those promises, but with very li little action uh, going together. So um, I don't see us being able to meet those very uh, huge mitigation uh, targets that we need to, to meet in the next 10 years in 2050 gets to uh, net zero if we are not uh, providing the assistance that countries need to make a just transition. And this is not really happening, at least for now, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Beatrice. Linda? Yes, I agree with Lisa and Beatrice that I think uh, the, the, the main problem here is uh, financing developing countries to be able to reach their goals. And if, you know, if the 100 billion is not there and then how are these countries are going to, you know, stay afloat? I don't understand. Uh, I don't understand the logic of it, of asking, you know, uh, countries like Indonesia, India, Brazil, the Philippines, you know, like, you know, Africa and African countries to be able to stop emission and just live their life. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so unless, unless the, you know, the developed part of the world is, you know, taking the baggage together and trying to get this afloat and then, and then that's that for, for net zero and that's that for, you know, GHG emission reduction because, you know, develop, developing countries will go back to coal, will go back to the forest and will go back to, you know, res resource extractions because that's how they survive, sadly. Yeah. Sadly. Um, we have a question here, which I think was a question and a comment here, which I think is really interesting because we have not mentioned the word methane at all. So um, Dr. Anton Gao from uh, National Tsinghua University has mentioned that in spite of being described as lukewarm, the entire COP26, he thinks that the word, you know, the methane issue has been quite, um, has been a not lukewarm issue. 
Um, he points out to the fact that um, it basically gave a big stir. I absolutely agree with you, to you with you that methane for the first time is getting the attention it deserves, given that it has a carbon dioxide equivalent uh, greenhouse gas potency that's really high. Um, he asked, he wants to hear um, the views that uh, uh, around the panel about how this issue of methane, um, because it would influence the production and the use of transitional energy. Um, what are your views on this? Is it is it a good thing? Um, is it important? And should we be paying more attention to the use of uh, to the phasing out of the you know the reduction of methane emissions? Um, Linda, you um, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, thank you, Jolene. So uh, actually, I already uh, typed in uh, my answer to Anton, but I would like to add that um, I think I I think I support uh, the methane pledge. It's very important. It's for short-term uh, emission cut because methane is methane is short-lived. So, but it's not it's not a substitution for CO two cut, uh, other GHG emission cut. So we need to um, we need to applaud the effort, but also that should not take our attention away from you know from the other ghg gases that are you know more pressing also in terms of uh uh emission cut and keeping the temperature low that's that's in my that's in my um uh, in my thinking i think we we still need to uh think about co2 methane is is good that somebody is is thinking about it it is going to hamper like some of the developing countries but if they can deal with it then that's great but also these developing countries and these uh industry giants they need to think about still the ghg emission cut thank you thank you linda but beatrice i have a question here from the audience for you Despite the fact that the forest declaration is non-binding, can it still be of use in legal action and for holding uh, corporations and governments accountable? That's a good question. Um, I, would, I would say yes, because I guess we do have a clear global target that we have to reach, right? So uh, if you think of legal action, how I think the argument would be how how are you going to reach that target if no act no action is taken? So we need to take those actions that will lead us to that end goal, that target. So that is a, an, an important si signal, and that this is something that could be used to uh, force governments to take that action that is needed to get to that um, goal. So yeah, uh, despite being a, 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 a non-legally binding instrument. Thank you, Beatrice. We have no more time for questions, but I would like to give um, uh, Lisa, Beatrice, and Linda uh, a minute to just wrap up whatever uh, last minute, uh, sorry, concluding thoughts uh, as we uh, bring this um, webinar to a close. Lisa. Hi, um, so thank you so much for, for the invitation to, to join the fireside chat with you this morning. Um, it's been an honor and a pleasure to join our dear colleagues here uh, to, to talk about uh, just about anything to do with the COP26. And, and I think we covered a lot of um, and a lot of interesting issues. Um, just fi one final thought that came up to me is that um, I've seen the, the, uh, the plans of our the Philippine government to transition away from coal and by, by using you know um, the transition towards oil and natural gas as you know the transition gases as we, we call it but uh, that also alarms that similarly uh, as, as we know you know there are there are still some um, um, adverse impacts especially on, on, on the climate um, and, and the emission will continue, as mentioned by um, Anton. Uh, the methane is, uh, although there was a pledge during COP, um, some governments are using actually the the you know the phase down from coal as an excuse to go towards the transition to this transition gases. So, um, in fact, in our plan, uh, the Philippines is going to be the hub, the regional hub for. Uh, the import and exportation of transition gases. So that's something that we are actually um, 
closely monitoring in, in the Philippines and, and that will actually have a, a bigger impact, especially uh, when we talk about you know, our, um, our commitments towards uh, uh, the Paris Agreement. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Beatrice, over to you. Thank you so much, Jolene, for this opportunity. I think these discussions are fantastic and they should keep going. I think us as civil society, we have a role now to really watch what is happening, to monitor and to make sure that our governments, they do translate those promises and pledges into real action. And this is our role, I guess, to monitor and make this happen, you know, despite, you know, being small, what we can do, but if each of us, we, we collectively, we do it, then it's more likely that those uh, outcomes will be met. So thank you so much for providing us with that opportunity for us to have that discussion. And it has been a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beatrice. Linda. Uh, thank you, uh, Jolene and ladies and uh, all participants who have been listening to us. And I think, I think this is, we haven't from now until next year, until they have their next COP and see how these governments are going to be able to walk the walk you know and and not just talk the talk so um and and i agree with beatrice that it's our job as you know citizens and as civil society to to keep watch of what's going on and also to do our part because uh despite of COVID, despite of everything we can still uh watch out for each other and this is this is our role and um uh, not just to criticize, but also to uh, remind each other that this is still important. We can still do something, uh, right? Uh, although, you know, all these pledges, uh, they are good, but we need to do them. <laughs> not just on paper or on, on the media, but we need to do them in real life. And we need to look at the local level and see whether, you know, there are regulations that are implementing them with that, whether, you know, there are, you know, local governments are really doing what the national governments are uh, pledging in the international level. Thank you so much. Thank you. It only leaves me to thank my colleagues, Joel and Alicia, for putting this together at very short notice. This was inspired last week while Linda and I were in a particularly renty mood. So um, we really enjoyed the opportunity to share uh, our thoughts uh, with, with, with everyone. And I am very grateful to the um, 80 plus participants who are actually joining us on a Monday morning or evening or afternoon and uh, look forward to keeping the dialogue going. It's important. I think that um, the, uh, it's not just about you know, broadcasting views, but the idea that um, as citizens, as academics, as consumers, um, we, we do have a role to play, starting with our consumption habits, for example. Right? Um, so thank you, everyone. And I look forward to joining you another day. Thank you. <laughs>